Good afternoon, Ivan. How are you? Good to see you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to provide just a brief synopsis, if I may, of our efforts in support of Operation United Assistance, and then I'll be happy to take your questions. It's fair to say that the Southeast Asia earthquake and follow-on tsunami on Sunday, the 26th of December, will necessitate one of the most complex humanitarian disaster relief efforts of recent history. Striking nearly all shores of the Indian Ocean, millions of people in multiple countries faced unimaginable destruction in a brief period of time. At the U.S. Pacific Command, we began a planning effort in the first 24 hours of this catastrophe. On Monday, we communicated directly with our ambassadors in the region and the senior military leaders in several of the worst hit countries. Our goal was to understand how our capacity and supply could best be used to help regional neighbors in need. A joint task force under the command of Lieutenant General Rusty Blackman was ordered stood up at the same point in time. Damage assessment teams were ordered to Indonesia and to Thailand and Sri Lanka within 48 hours to let us know the dimension of this catastrophe and at the same time provide the immediate relief that we knew was going to be required, like water and medical aid. To the greatest degree possible, we wanted to begin moving resources simultaneously with our assessments. We ordered the Abraham Lincoln Carrier Group to proceed at best speed from Hong Kong toward Indonesia. We then ordered the USS Bonham Richard Expeditionary Group from an area that was just south of Guam toward Indonesia also at best speed. We knew from our recent disaster response in the Philippines and our 1991 response to cyclonic flooding in Bangladesh, which was Operation Sea Angel, that immediate needs were going to be drinking water and shelter and food and medical support. A key lesson from all of these events was the value of helicopter vertical lift. The ability to rapidly apply needed capabilities in response to a crisis reflects well, I believe, on our force posture and investment in the Asian Pacific region. The speed with which we will bring forces and have brought forces such as the carrier and expeditionary groups as well as P3s and C-130s to bear for immediate employment is critical in a region characterized by vast distances of time and space. As I mentioned earlier, we stood up initially Joint Task Force 536, now redesignated as Combined Support Force, or CSF, and that's led once again by Lieutenant General Rusty Blackman. And this was important to manage the magnitude of this crisis operation. Our combined support force will help coordinate the contributions of our military, other nations, and other organizations. Our strong ally, Thailand, quickly responded to our request to allow us to center General Blackman's operations in Utapau, thus strengthening the capacity of U.S. forces providing relief in the region. From that hub location, he's ensuring close coordination of all elements on the ground and at sea while synchronizing multiple efforts in the region to support nations as they best see fit. It's important to point out that this likely could not have happened without our ongoing security cooperation efforts designed to strengthen our alliance with Thailand and all the countries of this region and the fact that we've been able to build enduring habits of cooperation over a long period of time. We'd all, we should all be proud of our service members as well as the other governmental and non-governmental organizations, all of who are responding quickly with great energy and compassion. They're putting an extraordinary humanitarian face on a particularly large undertaking. There's an important point that I'd like to reiterate. We see our job as one of assistance. Many organizations, international, national, governmental, and non-governmental, have joined together to help. We've coordinated closely with the State Department and with USAID, and we're in support to the host nation who's responsible for its citizens. So the U.S. Pacific Command and the Combined Support Force bring unique capacity quickly to support these dedicated volunteers. 
all of us who are working together to lend a hand, mindful that we do so in a way that meets the request of our host governments. And we join with many to provide assistance and relief. It's hard for us to comprehend the devastation suffered by so many. And over the next days and weeks and months, we'll push forward to provide aid and comfort, responding with a team of dedicated countries and organizations, and we'll continuously improve our efforts as we go. Thank you, and now I'll be happy to take your questions. Please. Yeah, uh, Admiral, uh, how many Marines from the Bonhomme Richard group are going to be going ashore? And uh, where are they going to do that, and what will their duties be? Well, I think it's hard to say what the, what the numbers that will actually go ashore are. It'll be very dependent on the specific uh, priorities and tasks that are laid out. Uh, obviously, a number will go ashore to provide helicopter lift because Bonham Richard has both H-53s and H-46s, and their lift capacity, their carrying capacity, uh, exceeds those of the H-60s that we currently have in Indonesia. Uh, there will also be medics. Uh, I suspect there will be engineering capability from the Bonham Richard that also goes ashore. So it will dependent, be dependent on the task. Uh, some will remain ashore for uh, significant periods of times, but others will use the sea base as a point to provide support. Admiral Argo, you mentioned the critical role that helicopters have played in the relief operations. Uh, according to the account we've given this morning, there were something like 46 U.S. helicopters in the region. My question is, um, how much difference is that number of helicopters making? Uh, wouldn't, say, double the number of helicopters be twice as good, or is there a logistical limit on how many helicopters you can operate? And are, are there any more plans to send any more helicopters? Well, there are plans to send more helicopters. Right now, we've got the Fort McHenry underway from uh, Okinawa with six H-46s. We also have the Niagara Falls uh, underway from Guam uh, with additional uh, helicopters. And some of our, our partner nations, uh, like Singapore, are going to add additional uh, helicopters. Uh, uh, fundamentally, helicopters are a tremendous advantage because, of course, uh, they don't have the same restrictions as fixed-wing aircraft in terms of, of how many you can have on the ground at a time. Uh, you ask the question, is, is double the number of helicopters better? Uh, does it produce twice as much? Maybe pretty close to, to twice as much. And so it will remain a priority in terms of this relief effort. Well, just, to follow, just to follow up on that issue, sure, are the U.S. operations in Afghanistan and Iraq in any way limiting the U.S. ability to provide more uh, aid, particularly in the areas of helicopters or other? Uh, uh, none whatsoever. Why, why not? Well, fundamentally, we had these assets uh, in the Pacific and we're employing them for uh, an array of, of other operations. And, you know, we have a certain capacity that we always maintain in the Pacific. So, uh, so we haven't had to decrement uh, those capabilities in Afghanistan and Iraq. Ivan? Margo, uh, two quick <coughs> questions, sir, if I may. Uh, one, do you plan to send the Mercy, the hospital ship? Uh, and two, distribution is now perhaps the most pressing problem. Uh, stockpiles of supplies are building up at airfields and elsewhere. Uh, but there is just no proper way now to get them to the needed in a hurry. Did you consider, or is there still a possibility that you would consider uh, airdropping MREs and bladders of water, or have you ruled it out? Uh, let me answer the first question on, on Mercy. Uh, we're looking very carefully at uh, deploying Mercy. In fact, we've got her on sea trials today to make sure that, uh, that she's ready to go. Uh, we haven't made that decision yet, uh, but if we do, uh, we're going to deploy her in, a, in an imaginative way. Of course, you know that these hospital ships were normally uh, used for trauma uh, in combat, but, uh, but we think that there may be an opportunity to configure the Mercy with uh, a humanitarian assistance crew uh, that w might be staffed significantly by non-governmental organizations and people that have uh, significant medical capability and can provide uh, relief in other forms. So. Uh, we're looking very closely at this, and, and this may be a, an opportunity to use uh, Mercy in a very creative way. It's the distribution and the airdrop of MREs and water We're water looking at airdrop. Uh, airdrop requires very close coordination, as you know, uh, on the ground. That means we have to have people into these regions before we can conduct that. But that is, that is one of the courses of action we're examining. Um, I'm wondering, 
if you're satisfied with the level, not just helicopters, but the overall level of assets that you have there and whether or not you plan to increase them. And second of all, the United States Navy was very early on the scene doing assessments, um, uh, doing aerial surveillance. I'm wondering, have you done your own damage <coughs> assessments? And I'm wondering if you have, whether you can share them with us uh, in terms of your own assessments of, of, of dead, injured, and the economic damage that's been done. Well, I can't speak to the last part of that. Uh, you know, we'll have to allow experts that can do economic assessments uh, in a proper way. Uh, you know, we have done uh, some some assessments that uh, that primarily looked at things like infrastructure, what ports and airfields would be usable, uh, where the bridges and roads were out. Uh, for example, we know along the uh, south and east coast of Sri Lanka, there's some 29 bridges are are gone. Uh, yeah, we know from uh, from looking at the west coast of Sumatra uh, that the devastation is significant and the, the tsunami uh, went well inland in terms of its level of, of destruction. So, uh, you know, we have assessments. We also, uh, you know, work very closely with the rest of these uh, international organizations to combine and fuse the, their assessments uh, together such that uh, we can provide a comprehensive uh, effort to address the priorities that will develop from those assessments. Could you address the first part of this question about your satisfaction? The overall the, level. Yeah, I think, I think we're, we're fine right now. I mean, we, we're moving things into theater uh, to increase the capacity and, and certainly, uh, you know, we're looking at other capability in the, uh, in the continental United States that, that might be specific to this. But there are other pieces that are moving. For example, the marine pre-positioning ships were, were moving toward the area because they have a tremendous water making capacity. In addition to that, they also have significant engineering capability uh, on board. So, uh, you know, those are capabilities that are particularly important. Uh, we're moving environmental preventive medicine units uh, into the area because we recognize that disease could be a factor and we want to get a head start uh, on this. So we're looking at a, a wide range of capabilities. Admiral, do you have any preliminary cost estimates of the U.S. military relief effort here and uh, any idea where the money is going to come from? Well, I can't give you any definitive uh, cost estimates. I mean, we, we know what it costs to, uh, to operate a, you know, a battle group at sea and an expeditionary strike group at, at sea, about two and a half million dollars a day. Uh, but that includes the people and the training and, and the entire investment. A, a lot of these costs, of course, uh, have taken place uh, already. I mean, a lot of these funds have already been expended for uh, for deployments uh, to provide the, the presence and deterrence in the Western uh, Pacific. I, I think one of the things that uh, comes to mind immediately is, uh, you know, the American taxpayers made a, uh, an investment in a, uh, a very solid and robust uh, military capability that has a wide range of uses, and we're, uh, we're demonstrating uh, the value of that investment today. Sir? Please. Um, could you give us a, uh, a logistical question? Um, you, you've mentioned several of the ships that are already there. It sounds like there are a lot more coming. Uh, yesterday at PACOM, I think they said there were about 13,000 folks in theater on the way there. What's your glide path? How many ships will you have there? How many people will be there at the height of what you're currently planning? Well, I think the 13,000 number is a, is a pretty good number, and I'd probably break it down right now to say we've got about 1,000 people in uh, in Thailand between one and 200 at any given point in time and in Indonesia uh, and uh, Sri Lanka and Malaysia and then about 11,000 almost 12,000 uh, at sea. Uh, as we uh, as we bring ships like Fort McHenry and Niagara Falls into play and and other units uh, you know these numbers will uh, increase by uh, 10 uh, 15 percent at I'm not nearly as worried about numbers as I am making sure that we have targeted the right capabilities to the problem. Um, so, you know, we're going to stay in, in close coordination with uh, the relief professionals to make sure that we're providing both them and the host nations uh, what the host nations ask for. Well, I'm sorry, about the safety of, of the forces that are there now, um, any, do you have seismic monitors or anything to determine if there is another earthquake of this magnitude and, and the, any waves that might come and hit the ships that you have there? Well, we have a pretty extensive system in the in the Pacific, as you may be aware of, and, and certainly that will provide an indication if there's another seismic event and, 
and we'll provide uh, those indications to, to our forces there. You mentioned Please. earlier that the missions in Iraq and Afghanistan were not a hindrance to what you're doing and that Pacific Command has enough resources. However, on a day-to-day -day basis, those resources have an important job deterring and dissuading possible adversaries, defeating them if required to do so. Sure. In that first 24 hours, what kind of risk analysis did you undertake to make sure that the national security mission is not hindered by the relief mission? You know, this is almost a continuing process at, at PACOM. Every time we, uh, we evaluate the deployment order, every time we look at, at moving force structure, even you know, north to south or, or east to west, uh, we do a risk assessment as to how it impacts our, our ability to deter. Uh, we also stay in very close contact with folks like General Leon Laporte in, in Korea. And in this particular case, uh, uh, we talked about uh, Korea in, in some depth, and, and I was very comfortable with uh, the movement our, of our forces. So it's an ongoing process. Uh, uh, we did uh, a solid risk assessment, and I'm comfortable with our posture. Please. You, you mentioned that uh, the long-standing military relationship with Thailand helped ease the way toward getting things started. Can you contrast that to the situation in having to deal with the Indonesian military and the Indonesian government, mm -hmm. where you didn't have that kind of history? Yeah, and I don't want to. Thailand is, a, you know, is a treaty ally, and they've been uh, they've been very helpful. But uh, I don't want to to give you the impression that uh, Thailand is the only one that stood up right away because uh, all the countries of the region. Uh, have you know we're we put together this combined support force uh, headed by General Blackman, and of course the basis of that, uh, the basis of their effort is a multinational standard operating procedure uh, that has been uh, worked through by 31 countries in the region. So, you know this isn't something that just comes together at a moment's notice. It's based on an investment uh, of time and and effort uh, collectively uh, of all the countries in in the region. And uh, very frankly, the reason that uh, we have the access we do, uh, the support we do, and have been able to move with the kind of speed is because we've made an investment in these relationships and theater security cooperation in the past over many years. Does that include uh, it includes uh, Indonesia, obviously to a lesser extent because of, of some of the restrictions that, that we've had, uh, but we have worked hard to build that relationship with Indonesia over the last two years. Uh, you were talking about could, could you, uh, you tell us about any particular challenges that the pilots of the helicopters are facing as they're going and delivering uh, the relief supplies and then in turn picking up some of the injured? Uh, when it comes to finding villages, finding specific destinations, because the tsunami in some cases changed the landscape so dramatically, can you discuss that if that, that is at all a problem and how they're, how they're managing to grapple with that? Well, I think that's probably a better question for, for General Blackman and the folks on the scene and, and maybe even Admiral Crowder, who, of course, is, uh, as, uh, is working those helos into specific locations. But uh, just from a generic standpoint, of course, you've you got to find a, a landing zone. And, uh, and sometimes we'll go over and try to do uh, some reconnaissance in advance to find a, a good, clean landing zone that you can get the, the helicopter down. And then, of course, uh, a coordination on the ground is important, too, to make sure that you don't injure anybody uh, in the process of, of moving the helo in. Those are probably the, the biggest considerations, just the, the safety of the operation. But, you know, our folks are, are well trained at this, and those, those air crews on the helicopters have uh, some significant experience of moving into, into places where maybe they haven't uh, had an opportunity to, uh, to train before, and uh, they're doing it very successfully. Okay. Also, there was a follow-up to that. When you did say you went in initially to survey the region and find out where there were ports that were usable, where there were landing fields or strips or areas that were usable, did, did the U.S. military find areas that it had known and was familiar with before dramatically changed? It was, was that at all a difficulty? Uh, Indonesia, and specifically Aceh, is, is not a place that we have a, a lot of operating familiarity, so uh, the answer to that is, is probably no. Admiral, you talked about some previous humanitarian missions you did pick on that had run. Um, had you planned for or even envisioned anything on this scale or to this magnitude bef uh, in your in your you know, previous plan? Well, it's hard to say you've ever planned for anything on on this magnitude because, uh, frankly, uh, you know we haven't seen anything of this size before. But I would say that you know Cobra Gold, which is our our large multinational exercise that we conduct uh, every year uh, in Thailand. Uh, is specifically pointed toward 
uh, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, and peacekeeping. And of course, it brings uh, a large number of the nations of the region uh, together to uh, to work in uh, in this same manner. So uh, you can't point yourself toward a, a specific catastrophe like this, but you can put in place uh, the basic training, uh, the habitual relationships, and as I pointed out, the standard operating procedures that apply to a, a wide range of contingencies and crises. Admiral, Admiral, there are reports that Sri Lanka has scaled back uh, its request for what you uh, what they need there. Can you give us an update on what the request is, what you have there, what assets you have there, what you have headed there? And also, um, I, I've read on the wires that uh, some of the rebels there are suggesting that there are less than humanitarian uh, interests involved in some of the assets that are being sent there. Well, Sri Lanka, uh, very specifically, there's been a, a great deal of, of international aid uh, go into uh, Colombo, and of course the immediate priority uh, is is distribution. Uh, what the Sri Lankans have, have asked for, and, and in my conversations with our ambassador out there, he's pointed out that uh, that engineering assistance is going to be uh, helpful, and this would be uh, you know, the kind of engineering assistance that might be provided by CBs, for example, uh, just to, to make roads passable and bridges usable. Uh, that and medical assistance are the two biggest requests from Sri Lanka, and so we're tailoring our response accordingly. Sir, to come back to the Please. question, thank you, of cost, do you foresee a point where the costs of having all these different uh, groups working on this might start to be a problem? This is something that's going to be going on for a long time. At what point do, does the money start to become a worry? Well, I think you know the international community has stepped up magnificently in in terms of uh, of funds for this, and and certainly uh, the the cost piece of this thing uh, is not something that uh, is significant to to my planning right now. And I'd, I'd like to reiterate once again, uh, one of the reasons we're able to do this is because we've already made this investment in uh, in the carrier battle groups and the uh, expeditionary strike groups and the C-130s and the P-3s and the and the training. So. Uh, we have a lot of this uh, available, and we use it for multiple purposes. And right now, we're using it for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. General, uh, on the subject of uh, particularly Americans who are still unaccounted for, mm -hmm. is the uh, U.S. military's mission include particularly helping to account for Americans and to identify remains of, of Americans? I, I would say that the primary lead on that uh, belongs to the State Department and the and the Chief of Mission. Uh, in country, and we're responding uh, to their requests. How about forensics teams? Are you expanding the number of forensics teams you're sending? Uh, you know? We are providing uh, forensics teams. Uh, as you know, uh, I have uh, uh, the joint POW MIA accounting command that is uh, resident in Hawaii and part of the Pacific Command, and they have significant expertise in this area. I'll Please. have a follow-up from an earlier question. <coughs> you mentioned that in Aceh province, you obviously haven't had much experience there mainly because of the, uh, the conflict that's been going on. Can you talk about the conflict there as well as in Sri Lanka, what you see on the ground, how this disaster has affected things on the ground? Do you see that as a potential problem, particularly in Aceh province, of getting aid to people? And, and in terms of just uh, <coughs> protecting the U.S. forces that are there? Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't seen it as a problem in terms of uh, of aid distribution or relief. Uh, uh, you know, I would hope that uh, uh, this catastrophe, as, as awful as it is, uh, uh, might provide an opportunity for these uh, different factions to move closer together. General, uh, Admiral, I apologize for belaboring this question, but I'm just having a, for a couple more, little right. trouble un understanding this. I know you mentioned that more helicopters are being sent, and, and you uh, outlined a couple, I think a dozen right. or so. but. Since they seem to be so important and so valuable, why aren't you sending significantly larger numbers of helicopters? Is that they're not available? Is it that they can't be used? Is it that they're not no, really think, needed? Or no, why I, not? I think we are. We are sending significantly large numbers of. You know, we're taking. A, we're going to use medevac helicopters out of uh, out of Korea. Uh, as I said, we're we're taking helicopters out of out of Guam. The helicopter detachment we have there. And, and I think that's going to answer the, uh, the mail in terms of the capability that we need in these, these countries. Now, you also have to understand that there are helicopters on the Singapore ships, the LST uh, that is there. The, the Japanese are going to provide an LST. They're going to have vertical lift uh, capability. Uh, 
the the Indians have significant helicopters in play also. Do you have any idea how many U.S. military helicopters will be uh, deployed eventually? Well, I would say probably double the number that we have right now. Is That's a rough order of magnitude just based on the flow that I've I've looked at. And if, if we find that we can't, you know, address those concerns uh, with what we have, uh, then we'll, uh, we'll reach farther. But my sense is that uh, the other thing that's going to come into play here is there's a there's a great deal of, of international uh, work being done by the, by professional relief and aid agencies, NGOs, if you will, uh, and of course, as I said, the international community has been very generous with their their funding. So some of this capability uh, in the very near future will be contracted too, and that'll get money into the economies, and that'll be helpful also. I have one quick follow-up. Okay. That doesn't have much to do with the uh, with the humanitarian efforts, but you're using. I think for the first time, the Westpac uh, 3 Express, this high-speed vessel right. out of Okinawa, is this an effect, it's a long distance for, is this a, the longest distance she's traveled, and is this kind of a shakedown cruise for the future, perhaps, with a type of Navy vessel? Well, I can't tell you whether this is the longest distance that, uh, this is the high-speed vessel we're talking about, the Westpac Express that, that the Marines have been leasing uh, for the last year and a half, and we've found it provides tremendous utility. Uh, the reason I can't answer the specific question is the Westpac Express has been uh, almost everywhere in the Pacific over the last 18 months, including down to Australia. But I think the message is, is that high-speed vessels of this nature, vessels that can move 40, 45 knots, that can carry a great deal of cargo, and in this case she's actually moving helicopters, are going to be a big part of the future. Last question. On, the, on, on the, the seismic activity, what did PACOM notice on, on the morning that this happened, and what's your standard operating <coughs> procedure? Do you guys have an arrangement that you alert other militaries, other governments, and is there talk of changing that? Well, uh, fundamentally, there, as I said, there is a, a Pacific tsunami warning system uh, that worked in the Pacific. There isn't one, as you know, in the, in the Indian Ocean. The tsunami uh, warning center uh, picked up the seismic event. I made an evaluation uh, with respect to the Pacific and notified uh, the, the Pacific Command. Uh, you know, what, what obviously is going to have to be addressed in the future is whether we need, uh, and by we I mean the international community needs a similar system in the Indian Ocean. Thanks very much. Uh, we got, whoop. Admiral, um, do you anticipate the call up of any reserves, particularly medical and CBs, to uh, help augment your forces? And is that a uh, situation that might be difficult with Iraq and Afghanistan deployments? Uh, right now, we haven't made any specific requests for, uh, uh, for medical reserves. Uh, uh, we'll continue to evaluate the situation that develops. I think, uh, you know, if we can do a good job of, of getting water uh, into these locations, uh, do a good job of preventing disease, uh, do a good job of using the capabilities we have at hand right now, like these uh, uh, preventive medicine units that we're already sending, that uh, hopefully that won't be required. Thank you. Again. Admiral, you said double the number of helicopters. Can you give us a figure for the current? The current. What figure should we double? The, the, I think the fact sheet you have right now currently says we have about uh, 45 actually in the, the the theater now, and and that number uh, could double. Uh, but I would also add that you know we're not doing this in, in isolation. And we will look at the contributions that are being made by the wide range of militaries in the, in the region and make sure that the aggregate uh, can handle the problem. And the two and a half million dollar operating cost per day, was that only for the carrier battle group or did that include other ships? That's just for the carrier battle group. Well, Thank you, Robert. Continue on doing Iraq. Thank you. Could you stay another half hour?